All right, so obviously we're doing this a little different today. So let's go ahead and get started. I'll show you uh, what I'm talking about. I, I picked this up from uh, one of the classes that I went to. Teachers go to this uh, the statewide convention every year, and uh, I got to speak them, and I thought it was a, a really good idea. So this is an example of some student work uh, where, uh, in this case, you see a big red X, there's a mistake made. I identified that there is a mistake, what the mistake even was, but you have to just like see why it was a mistake and what you should do to correct it. So Molly, this person, has a uh, graph to graph this quadratic in standard form incorrectly. Here's her work. So, ooh, not leaving it up for, you know, it's not a mystery. It's the vertex that's incorrect. Why is the vertex incorrect? So what I want you to do, you see a little pen right there, that, intent, that means that I intend you to write some stuff down. So why don't we go ahead and get our, our notebooks out, maybe starter notes, or this could, this could be a continuation of your notes from last time. Once you get them out, just respond to those questions. Why is the vertex incorrect? Which coefficient could have told Molly that we were to correct? Standard form, there's like this formula for what? You can say um, yes and more. You say that. Yes and more. What about the vertex? For the vertex? So the vertex is correct. infinite number of points in this thing, right? It's the x of, the, of a specific point. You already said that. So, the thing we're talking about. so negative b over 2a is both the equation for finding the line of symmetry and also the x uh, part of the, the vertex. The, the vertex is a coordinate, it's a, it's a point. It's a point somewhere in the plane. Okay? So to find the x part of that vertex, negative b over 2a if we're in standard form like we are here. Okay. So she did it right. Okay, so 
What she missing? here is, well, the, where she's drawn this point, the y is what? What's the y? Like this point right here that she's drawn. What's the y value? Zero. Y is positive here, it's negative down here, and along here it's zero. So she didn't find the, the y value of the vertex. Talking about the vertex, and say we didn't find the y value by the vertex, so we have a y value. If we have the x value, how do we find the y value? This is always true. For any x value, if you want to find the y value, what do you do? Put it in the equation for x. That's what functions do. Functions, simple functions, turn x's into y's. Okay? Our basic functions, we use y, we use x. Put things in for x, you get out things for y. Okay, so let's just fix that real quick. y is equal to negative 2 times negative 3 halves squared minus 6 times negative 3 halves plus 3. That's negative 2 times, so it's negative 3 halves squared. positive, so plus, so this 2 cancels with this 6, so we get 3, so plus 9, 3 times 3 is 9, plus 3, this 2 cancels with this 4, now we're left with negative 9 halves, plus 9, plus 3, that'll be, let's just say, 7 and a half, 12 minus those 9 halves, So, right, we just found this number seven and a half. What is that thing? What is seven and a half? <coughs> What's the significance of the number seven and a half? It's the it's the y value, right? It's the y value of the vertex. So now we know the vertex is at negative three halves and seven and a half. So we, right, we could just graph that new vertex, that correct vertex um, right here. So negative 3 halves and 7 and a half. There's 7 and a half uh, right there. Okay. So the axis of symmetry was correct. We did negative b over 2a correctly, but we forgot about the y value. And um, Molly also did this correctly. You know, what, what did she do here? What's, what's happening here? What's she doing? Setting the x equal to zero. Setting the x equal to zero, put zero for it in for x. What good does that do? Helps you get the y. Helps you get what? The y value. Of what? Vertex? Yeah. The vertex we already found, negative b over 2a, was negative 3 halves. We put negative 3 halves into the function, got 7 and a half. If we put 0 in for x, does that tell us where the vertex is? Yeah. <coughs> On the x intercept? Or no, sorry, the y intercept? So she just chose to put 0 in for x, 0, 0 which is convenient because this will become zero, this will become zero, the only thing left is plus three. So we get this point zero comma three. So she did that correctly, and also the line of symmetry is correct, so 
that we could reflect that line over the line of symmetry and get some point. Okay, it was just that vertex. That vertex is incorrect. We needed the y value, and now we can draw it correctly. Next question says, there one of these coefficients here. What is, what is a coefficient? For one thing, let's say coefficient. A variable and a not variable. A variable and a variable. Is that what you're saying? Uh, a variable and a number that's not variable. Okay. Almost. The coefficient is just the number that you're multiplying by a variable. So negative 2 is a variable, negative 6 is or a coefficient, negative uh, 6 is a coefficient. So, and, and 3 is just a constant, right? So you can call that a coefficient. Um, which of those could tell you that this first vertex couldn't have been correct? here and get these correct points here and draw this parabola, that would be a contradiction to this negative in front of the x squared. That tells us it should open down. Right? That, it should, that doesn't tell us what the vertex is, but it does tell us this could be a vertex. Any vertex that's below these points uh, couldn't be a vertex. That's a vertex of this parabola anyway. Okay, so negative 2, because a negative that we find the correct vertex must be above these two points so that it would go down through them. Okay, any questions about that? No? All right. Here we go again. I'm going to have you write down these, the, your answers in your own words on a piece of paper with the written English language. Omar here is graphing incorrectly as well. First question, why is Omar's vertex incorrect? We're going to have some vertex issues again. if you can't really think out the person's mistake, it helps just to start over your own work, do the work yourself, and then see how your correct answer differs from your incorrect answer. So what's wrong with this vertex? Zero in for x. Um, so what should the vertex be? What's the correct vertex? Oh, I'm sorry, negative one. Just put negative one in there. Because you keep adding one divided by two. Uh huh. Make it a negative one. I mean, you're saying uh, you're 
starting with this. Oh yeah, I think so. And then putting one there. So, so the vertex should be what? Uh, negative one, negative three. Negative one, negative three. Is that what you're getting at? Okay. <coughs> so, if we, if we remember from our experimental uh, looking into uh, graphing in vertex form, remember this is going to move it up and down. This uh, will move it left and right. This will make it steeper or less steep. And if it's negative, it'll make it over down. Right, so plus one, a common mistake is to interpret that as shift to the right one. You say, okay, so that's the x value of the vertex, y value of the vertex, it moves down three, uh, so the y value is negative three, and we get one negative three of the vertex. So it should be um, negative one, negative How we came up with that, I, I'm guessing if I were to see a, a student work like that, I would think just mistakenly thought that was moved to the right, it's actually moved to the left. So negative one, negative three. Okay. And the x value of that vertex will always be the value of x that causes this parentheses to be zero. Okay. So if you set that equal to zero and find x, that'll tell you what the x value is for the vertex. Or it's just the opposite of that. So, well, he, he should have had his vertex over here. That's what it should have been, really nice and big. Um, then he found this point zero, negative one. How do you find that point zero, negative one? Put zero in for x. That's, you can see that. Well, if you go back through his work, put zero in for x. So the difference between this and this is that x is zero. And you just do the math, and y comes out to be negative 1. Substituted. Substituted. 0 for x. Why do you do that? Why do you put 0 in for x? the vertex is probably going to be pretty easy because the number's not going to be too big, but imagine imagine if you moved way over here, like you put in 7. Would that probably be a good choice for x? Why not? Why would it be a big number? Why would it be a very big number? Right? And you just wouldn't have room to graph that. So when you're finding other points, it'd probably be a good idea to stay near the vertex. Right? Don't, don't stray too far. Any questions about that? Or other Vertex form stuff. Okay. You can tell I ran out of name ideas and searched the internet for a diverse set of names. Probably somebody's name is Beja, and if they ever watch this video, I don't want it to uh, get offended. So, the lovely Beja graphed this quadratic and intercept form uh, correctly, right? Big read check, good job, did it correctly. So, the first thing I want you to, to answer, and this is kind of a, a, deep, a deep answer, a deep question here, a deep answer. Why did Beja set x minus 5?
help you along with that. We didn't do it here. We did set, set x plus 1 equal to 0. But we set x minus 5. And as you noticed, also x minus 1 equal to 0. So why would you set x minus 5 equal to 0? Why equal to 0 not equal to 1? the x-intercept. We're going to take it a little deeper. So well, that's like a, a surface answer to find, let's say, an, not the, but an x-intercept. If I set x plus 1 equal to 0, does that give me an x-intercept? No, it doesn't. So let's try and go a little deeper. Why does it even work? Why can't you just set that parentheses equal to 0, and then all of a sudden you have an x-intercept? set x minus 5 equal to 0, right? It's easy to solve for x, is that what you mean? Yeah. I'm just saying that's what it's probably easy. It's easy, but I mean setting x minus 5 equal to 1 is easy, or it would be equal to 5 is easy. Why set it equal to 0? And, and how does that tell you something about the, the x-axis? Asking, we specifically said x minus 5 equal to 0, and somehow that tells us what an x-intercept is. Um, we didn't set it equal to 5, we didn't set it equal to 1, right? 1 is another neo number, we didn't set it equal to 1, why don't we do that? Right? And just because we do set it equal to 0, how does that tell us about the x-intercept? If we set this equal to 0, x plus 1 equal to 0, that doesn't tell us about the x-intercept in this case. Uh, and you know, like we can't just choose pieces of like this, set this equal to zero, or set this equal to zero. Right? Why, why does this even work? Why is this working? Why is this telling us about the x-intercept? To set that equal to zero, or equivalently set that equal to zero, right? Both of these things. Because they're binomials? Yeah. A binomial is just, uh, this is a binomial right here, and this is a binomial right here. It just means there's two terms. Right? So, I mean, certainly binomial is easy to, easier to solve if you set it equal to zero. As Keenan said, it's just it's easier to solve for x. But why is it all working? x 
minus 5 equals 0. What I mean is this. This is like the chunk of, of this expression is 0. If we plop a 0 in there, we take those parentheses out and this place with a 0, then then what? What's a guarantee? If x minus 5 is 0, something else is guaranteed. Okay, x equals positive 5. Um, that's it's almost like saying the same thing. I mean, it is a consequence, but it's if x minus 5 is 0, x must be 5. Okay, so f, if x is 5, then x minus 5 is 0. And well, where does that get us? It's true that x is 5. That's not, that's not untrue. Yeah. x is going to equal 1? Are you talking about because for this to be 0, x must be 1? Well, whatever we put in for 1x, which Connor just explained would be 5, we'd have to put 5 there as well. Okay? But let's investigate that. If this is 0, that means x is 5, which means this is 5, which means 5 minus 1, that's 4, right? Okay, so we're getting there. So this is 4, this is still 0, this is 2, so what? If this is 2, and this is 0, and this is 4, then what? These are x intercepts, so we know that. Right? So if x minus 5 equals 0, we know that. Never mind. I'm not going to try to answer this question. Um, yeah. Let's see how that's far out of this question. Well, yeah. Uh, what, if, what if this is 2, and this is 0, and this is 4? What's going to happen? The whole side is 0. The whole thing is 0. How do you know? Because anything times zero is zero. You see how that's different from this one? We don't have just times, 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 times. We have this minus three. If this is zero, this this will be zero, but then we'll have minus three. We don't get we get minus three, we don't get zero. Okay? The very special thing about this arrangement, you know, intercept form, is that it's all multiplication. This times this piece times this piece. Well, if we could get one of those pieces to be zero, when you multiply all that stuff together and one of those things is zero, the answer will be zero too. Okay? So the reason why we set x minus 5 equals zero is because if x minus 5 equals zero, then y equals zero. Okay? The name of the game here is find points. Okay? And, and not only find points, find points smartly, intelligently. Find useful points. Just finding random points, we could do that all day. We could just plug in any value for x that we want, find out what the y value is, and we have a point. But if we find special points like a vertex or an x-intercept, it lets us know exactly where the parabola is and how steep it is and all those kinds of things. Right? Gives us an idea of like where the line of symmetry is, uh, where this parabola is kind of located. So if x minus 5 equals 0, then y equals 0, and we know that 5, 0 is on the graph. And similarly, we would set x minus 1 equals to 0, because if x minus 1 is 0, then whatever these turn out to be, we multiply these together, and then we multiply it by 0, we get 0. So also, if x minus 1 equals 0, then y equals 0, so then we know that 1 comma 0 is on the graph. why this is called intercept form, because it's all multiplied together. There's no plus or minus or anything left over on the, you know, on the side like this. Right? This, this certainly isn't all multiplication. But if it's an intercept form, it's conveniently multiplied together. And then if we could find a value of x that turns this to 0, we know y would have to be 0. Because it doesn't matter what these other two things are. If we can multiply by 0, we get 0. If this is 0, multiply by 0, we get 0. So we have these two useful points, not random points, but two points that are on the x-axis, two points that are directly across from each other, across from the, uh, well, reflected over the line of symmetry. Um, 
It tells us a whole lot of things. If we find those x-intercepts, they're, they're really useful points. Um, so finding those x-intercepts also informs this right here. Y to beta put three into the function. Right here, put three into the function. So why? Why did Beijing put three into the function? Okay. Because three is directly in the middle of one and five. Okay. So you can kind of interpret it, interpret this question two different ways. Why did you plug three into the function? Right? Why did you choose three? Well, because three is right in between one and five. So we say because uh, three is in middle of 1 and 5. That's true. It is, it is right in the middle. I mean, what, what's, so what? It's right in the middle of 1 and 5. Well, the parabola is reflected over the axis of C. So, go ahead. The y, the x-intercepts uh, are the same distance. Good. So the these two points that are at the same height, right? They're they're directly across from each other. Neither one is higher than the other, which means they must be they must be a reflection of each other over the line of symmetry. So the line of symmetry must be right in the middle. That's why it's important. That's why three being in the middle is significant. Okay. So because three is in the middle of one and five, that's why three was chosen. Okay. Well. That's cool. I mean, why, why do we need to put it in the function? We know three's right in the middle. We know the line of symmetry is right there. So this is how. This is the second way you could interpret it. Why did once she had three, knew three was right between? Why did she put it in the function? Right, the other half of the vertex. Well, the vertex must be at x equals three, and y equals. Well, we don't know until we put three into the function. So we put three in the function to find y, right? So uh, because three is in the middle of one and five, and putting three into the function, function will uh, reveal So three, it, it, it gives us that line of symmetry, right? Now all those points, uh, all points on the right side must reflect directly over the line of symmetry onto the left side. Um, but also, if we put three into the function, it'll tell us where the vertex is. So now we have three really uh, integral points to this parabola. We got the x-intercepts, we got the parabola, and now we can connect the three. With those three points, we got the we got the parabola in the right place. We've got an opening in the right direction. We've got it as steep as it should be. We've got all that good stuff. Any questions about that? So when we have a product, uh, just a product, right? we're not adding anything on or subtracting anything, that's really convenient because if we can get one of those things to be zero, we know the answer would have to be. So we're asking somebody who did something incorrectly, Gil, not write this function in standard form correctly. Did it work? Why is the final step incorrect? So write that down. If you see it, you take one to correct.
right down. You don't see it. Ask yourself if you were to go back up to the step before the last step, what would you have done? Why is that final step incorrect? Um, when you should have done what? On all of it. On all of it. That's called doing what? Distributing. Distributing. You didn't distribute it. You just multiplied it by x squared. Mm -hmm. So you multiply the two parentheses together, or gilded. Multiply the, the two parentheses together, and then you'll still the 4 is there, which needs to be distributed. Why is it incorrect because it didn't distribute? What process did Gil use to combine the two parentheses? Okay. So depending on if I if I you know got on my soapbox in this class or not. Uh, we got distribute and you got foil. Which is more happy? Foil. Distribute, right? What's foil? What foil is? Front, is outside, shape. inside. Front, last. outside, inside, last. Uh, first, inside, outside, last. It's just another way to distribute the unit. Yeah, it's a, it's a way to remember how to distribute, right? It's, it's only helping us to remember how to distribute. Distribution, <coughs> distribution is what's happening. Foil is just what we call a mnemonic device. Right? Can you think of any other mnemonic devices? It takes a long time. Anything that helps you remember is something that might be a little more complicated. MDOS is a, a mnemonic device? The alphabet. The alphabet? I say. Yeah. Maybe the song? Mm -hmm. The song, uh, the tune of it helps you remember the order of the letters. Uh, how about which months have 31 days and which months have 30? How do you remember that? Do the knuckles? That's what I do. Oh, this is great. So you, you make a fist. And you, I guess you can make one or you can make two. But here, January, February, March, April, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December. So if, you're, if you touch a knuckle, that's 31 days. In between knuckles is not 31 days. And the only exception of having not 30 days is February, which has 28 or 29 days. January 31, February 28 or 29. March 31, April 30, May 30, June 30, July 31. And the thing about between July and August is go from July back to the first knuckle, because July and August both have 31. So don't go back. <laughs> There's also a rhyme, 30, 30 days. days past September, April, November. Something like that, yeah. Right? Still, might be. It's something like that. A little rhyme, right. so you remember the, the months sure. that have uh, 30 and the other ones have uh, 31, or February uh, is the one exception to that. Uh, what's another one? How about homes? H-O-M-E-S? What? It's the sign of the mnemonic device. Homes? Homes? H-O-M-E-S. Oh, what? Like which lakes? The Great Lakes. The Great Lakes. You know, up in Illinois, well, Chicago. Well, yeah, Illinois and Michigan and up in there. So, Huron, Ontario, Michigan, Erie, and Superior. H O M E S. Wait, which one are we? Huron. I've never heard that one. Yeah. <laughs> now you know. Now you never forget Holmes, right? Okay. Now that mnemonic device is good because it's it only serves the purpose of remembering the Great Lakes, and you know that and. You don't make the mistake of thinking it helps you remember all the lakes. There's a lot more lakes than those five lakes. Right? The thing with FOIL, though, is that it, it has caused many a student to feel like, I know how to distribute. They don't really know that what they're doing is distributing. They're just saying, OK, multiply the first ones, the outside ones, the inside ones, and the last ones. Uh, and if you keep doing that, it won't work unless you have Two things, right? A binomial, bi meaning two, nomial meaning number, right? Two terms here and two terms here. If you do anything besides multiply a binomial times a binomial, FOIL doesn't work. It's a mnemonic device that is misleading. Okay? 
So that's that's why I am making a big deal about it because later on we're going to forget all about FOIL because we're not always going to multiply a binomial times a binomial. We're going to multiply a binomial times a trinomial, trinomial times trinomial, uh, and on up it goes. Yeah, and FOIL doesn't work. It misses stuff. And it's just the mnemonic device. It's not actually the math that we're doing. The math that we're doing is using the distributive property. Okay. So, and I was trying to bait you into saying FOIL because I just wanted to make this <coughs> Make sure you distribute everything to everything else. Every term in the one parenthesis to every term in the other parenthesis. Distribute x to there and to there, right? Now I've distributed x. And there's nothing else to distribute x to. There's only two things to multiply by. So then x is done and move on to 1. 1 gets distributed. And now we're done with 1. And everything in here has been distributed. So everything in here, we're done. Does that look exactly like FOIL? Yeah, it does. First, outside, inside, last. It's exactly the order that I did that in. Okay. Just a coincidence, right? And it doesn't even have to be foil. It doesn't have to be, it could be Leo or Goyf or whatever. Like, whatever order you do it in, it doesn't matter as long as everything gets multiplied by everything else. Okay. You can see here, I did it in a different order. I did x times x, right? x squared, and then 1 times x. And then negative 6 times this x, and then this 1 times. Uh, this negative six. Doesn't matter the order that you do it in. Okay. Last one from the quiz, last mistake to investigate. Nina, the name of my cat, did not find the maximum value, uh, the maximum, I should have put maximum or minimum. She's writing things. That's pretty impressive. But she can't find the minimum or maximum correctly. It's not that big a deal. Uh, but we want to. We want to be better than a cat. Um, so there you go. First question. Given that Mina did find the vertex correctly, why is her minimum value incorrect? Take a moment. Take a pencil or your pen. Write down your thoughts. Identified it as a minimum. Why is that minimum value correct? Okay. 130 is the minimum value. Okay. Um, when we talk about, I'll write it right here. By the minimum or maximum value, it's implied that we mean of. It's always good to go back and and, uh, and scoop up old knowledge and make sure that we've got a good grasp of this. We're going to go all the way back to what the definition of a function. What is a function? What defines a function? Where you plug things in, stuff in there. Beautiful, beautiful. Right? Stuff gets plugged in and stuff comes out. That's what a function is. And there's one more little thing that's really not important in this problem. The input output part is really the important. So one other thing about a function. Yeah? She's got one. I got it, but I can't Mina got it. Mina got her tongue. Mina got her tongue. Things that aren't functions can also have rules. No, I mean, there's lots of functions. Direct variation is a little small part of the function world. Each input has one output. There we go. Each input has one and only one. Right? One and only one output. So that's the thing. But the thing we want to concentrate on is that 
it has input, and it has output. Now, lots of functions can take in all the same things, right? They can take in one, take in two, take in three, take out, take in four. The thing that makes a function different from another function is what? The output, what comes out, okay? That's the value of a function, what comes out, okay? So in this example, 25 goes in, 130 comes out. Okay, so that's the first thing. The value of a function is its, is its y value, the output, okay? So for one thing, like 25 is not the value of a function. 25 is, is the input that gives you the value, the value of 130, okay? That's one way to look at it, because 25 is not the value. 130 is the value of the function. Um, well, here's another thing. I mean, we found the vertex, but how do we know that's even at a minimum or an average? Let's, let's look at it. And we don't have to graph this. We can imagine the graph of it. So the, the vertex is correct, 25, 130. So maybe this is 25, maybe this is 130. There's our, our vertex, right? How would you define the vertex? If somebody asked you over the phone, define for them a vertex. How would you define that? Oh, you're thinking about like a, a triangle, yeah. or, a, or a rectangle, or a square for that matter. Like a vertex would be where two yeah. things meet. Yeah, it's similar to that. Um, it's kind of where stuff comes together, right? In a, in a special place. It's not over here, it's not over here. It's like right there where they meet. Okay. But this doesn't really have an angle, right? It's this smooth curve. But we're, we're getting at it. Like the, the triangles have vertices. What's that? Probably Skype, whatever you're talking to. Oh, so like Okay. So how would you do it? Using a picture, you say, hey, let's get on Skype. I should show this to you. So how would you show them a vertex? Draw them a graph. Okay, I'll draw you a graph. A parabola. Yeah. So where's the vertex? At the lowest point. Ah, the lowest point. Where's the vertex now? At the highest point. The <coughs> vertex on a parabola will either be the lowest point or the highest point, depending on which way it opens. Right. If it opens up, there is no maximum value. This, you know, if we put arrows on this to signify that it goes up forever and ever and ever. And here, this goes down forever and ever, so this doesn't have a minimum value. But it does have a maximum, this one does. This one has a minimum, a very bottom, right? a very lowest value or a very highest value. So this one over here, um, which way does it open? How do you know? There's a what? I mean, I told you that. <laughs> How do you know it opens up? Because the uh, value that x is being multiplied by is 15 is positive. 15 is positive. That number in front of the parentheses is positive. What would make it open down? It's negative. It's negative. So, 15, because 15 is uh, positive, we know it opens up, okay? So, there we are, right? The vertex is, is where you'll find either the minimum or the maximum value. Okay. So why is the minimum value incorrect? Um, let's say because, let's say it could be because, um, 130. It shouldn't be hard to see that the vertex is the place where you find the minimum or the maximum, whichever one it happens to be. Okay. Given that, let, let's say she's identified that it's a minimum correctly, the minimum is not the x, it's the y. The y is the value of the function. All right, kind of gotten at this already. How did Mina know that this? 
this was a minimum value as opposed to a maximum value. Just by looking at the function itself, not even having to graph it, how does that tell you that it's a minimum, not a maximum? It's a positive, so without even having to draw the graph, because the graph will open up if I were to graph it, which means, well, there's a bunch of big values. It just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. But there is a smallest value, a minimum value. 15 is positive. 15 means I got rid of 12 pi bar clicks. That looks like is is positive. All right. So that's my last quiz question. Are there any other questions from the homework? We, uh, we just talked about this a little bit. The equation was in a different form. So tell whether the function has a minimum or a maximum value, then find the minimum or maximum value. So before we start anything, we should be able to tell whether it's a maximum value or a minimum value. Uh, looking at this equation, does this guy have a minimum or a maximum value? What tells you that? Negative 6 tells us what about the graph? Uh, well, if it's down, so it must <coughs> max out and then go back down. Okay, so it has a maximum. We know that. Now we actually find that maximum value. How are we going to find that maximum value? Well, it's the highest point. Okay, Which, what do we call that highest point? How do we find that vertex? Yeah. Yeah. Negative b over 2a. X equals negative b over 2a. Okay, so what's uh, what's b? Negative 1. Negative 6. No, 0. 0, right? Because b is the one that's multiplied by x. Not x squared. And it's not the constant, it's the number you multiply by x. Right, since we don't have an x value, what number must we be multiplying by x? Zero. Now that we have zero over, well, who cares what this is? Because even if we took the time to find that, uh, it would be quite useless. Right? Maximum, 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 maximum. maximum has got to be negative one because the x value is zero. Okay, but that's not that's not it, right? Zero is not the the final answer. Right? The value of a function is the y value. Output. So we'll take this, plug in our input, and our output, if that's zero, must be negative one. So the max at negative one. So here's the x-axis. I don't know where the y-axis is, right? So we'll just say that this guy must come up to some point, go back down, and this must be I guess we do know where the y axis is because we just found the x value of the vertex was zero. Zero, negative one is where the vertex is. The biggest value we can get out of this function is negative one. So that's how all those go, right? If, if we look at uh, 33 to 35, we got a negative in front, we must open down, we have a maximum. If we have a positive in front, most of them down, we have a minimum. And the negative b over 2a, plug that in, we find y. In this seg section? Yep. 44. Well, that's really 44 through 46, isn't it? Matthew? 
Well, let's, let's strictly say the 44, that's what was asked. Y equals 0.5x squared times 2x. Let's see. Uh, if we're looking at the graphs, we can see the vertex is given in all of them. Okay, so that's, that's something uh, noteworthy. Um, and in some cases, they give us just another point, or they give us a, a y intercept, or here we have a y and an x intercept, and, and c because it goes through the origin. So maybe we should look at the, the vertices, right? All the vertices are different for each of these. How about we just find the vertex for this guy? That'll tell us which one is here, see it is. How do we find the vertex? <laughs> That's two. Well, what's two times a half? One. Two times a half is one. So, what's this? Two. The number two. What is that? It's negative b over two a. What does that tell us? A. X of what? The X of the vertex. So, the vertex is at two, comma. What? How do we find out? Two? That's x. If you want to find x, functions turn x's into y's, right? I'm going to write back in there. So 2 squared is 4. Here, we'll do it down here. 0.5 times 4. 2 squared is 4 minus 2 times 2. What's half of 4? 2 minus 4. Negative 2. So negative 2. 2 comma negative 2. Let's take a look. C. C has a vertex of 2, negative 2. None of the other ones do. Right? The only other thing we can do to verify that this is the, the absolutely correct choice would be to use the other piece of information they give us. And you go to 0, 0. How can we confirm that 0, 0 is on this graph? On this, the graph of this function? How can we confirm that this has 0, 0? Zeros are for the x's, and what should you get out for y? Zero. Zero, right? Zero for x, zero for y. That's what that point is saying. Zero, zero, zero squared times 0.5 is zero minus zero, zero minus zero, zero. Yeah, y is zero. Definitely got that right. So this function, you can see the picture of it there, models the jump of a red kangaroo where x is the horizontal distance of feet and y is the corresponding height. What is the kangaroo's maximum height? How long is the kangaroo's is the kangaroo's jump? So you can see the kangaroo is jumping like this, and so uh, the shape that its jump makes is a problem. Horizontal distance versus vertical height. So this function x is the horizontal distance. So you can plug five feet into there, and it'll tell you at five feet horizontally, its y is, you know, its vertical is about feet. So we want to know it's the maximum height of its jump. Well, that that'd be about here. This is on the ground. Up here would be it's maxed out. Well, how do we find the vertex given this equation? Uh, 
vertex form, right? We got one set of parentheses squared times a constant plus a constant. That's vertex form. So this minus 14 means it's a shift over a 14 and a move up a 6. So what's the highest that it can jump? 6, right? Horizontal distance. Vertical distance. Its maximum height is 6. Okay, so here's the, a slightly trivial question. How far does it jump from here to there? How far does it jump? To there? 28. Uh, 28. Yeah. This is 14, 6. That's half. We know parabolas are symmetrical, so I must go another 14 to get to the end. Okay, let's pass in the homework, please. Okay, we're going to start today talking about a really important word. Really important math word. Let me show you that. Solution is that important word. It's a really important word we use all the time. Right? You say the word solution probably quite a bit in the math class or explaining your math homework to your parents. Um, but you might still not know the meaning of it. So right here what I have is what the solution is not. So I made a little word all for what the solution is not. Um, it's not x, it's not y, it's not a function, it's not a coordinate, it's not an equation or the graph or a point or even the answer. Okay. This is number one, the, the most um, improper definition of the word solution. What's the solution? The answer. That's what I'll get back 99 times out of 100. Okay. Now, it it's, makes sense. Of course, I would say the answer is the solution. Like, they're synonymous in my brain. If I have a problem, and I find the answer, if I find the solution, it's the same thing. Okay. <coughs> That's what you would call a colloquial use of solution. What's colloquial mean? Colloquial. I'm going to teach you words in here, too. What is colloquial? Let's start with a word. It starts with a C. It starts with a C. Here you go. Look it up. Anybody come up with a definition of colloquial for
Here's the algorithm. Strip the ball. Here's the algorithm. Put your hand on the ball. Make the ball fumble. Okay. Um, so in math, solution means something really specific. It's not synonymous with the answer. Solution to an equation. How do you find the solution to an equation? We've defined it many times. You may not realize it, but I, I've restated this many different times. Right? And I'll keep on doing it until I say solution and you say, oh, this is a solution. Right? So, what's the solution to an equation? What is the definition of the solution to an equation? That an equation like 5x is Don't tell me what the solution is. That's boring. Everyone knows the solution is three. Okay, but how do I know that's the solution? How does that meet the definition of the solution? Well, you solve for it. Mm. You solve for it. That's another I, I, something that some like something we say that arises out of the colloquial use of solutions. Yeah. You take an evidence that you know and find the best. Oh, it fits. Okay, now, now we're kind of getting at it. Hey, Tyler's spitting truth over here. <laughs> no, I want to hear. No. Okay, Wait, it fits. Like, what do you mean it fits? Three fits. Um, like um. Uh, yeah, I can't really explain it. Okay, well let's just run with that. Maybe run with that or come up with your own definition. But I would say. Three fits with the equation definitely makes sense. It's definitely in keeping with the definition of solution. So here's the solution. How do we know? How does it fit the definition of the solution? Can you put that in? Can you answer? The answer. We're just that smart. <laughs> Tyler said, when you put three into the equation, uh, she said that's the answer. You get the right answer. We use this example, right? Three is the solution. Now, the definition of solution, how does that meet that definition? We started with what Tyler said here. When you put three into it, We follow these steps to find the solution. Yeah, we do find the solution. And the solution is like the answer to what we're trying to find. It starts this way. When you put the solution in there, what happens? You get the equation. Okay, there we go. What the equation says is true. So now we're more what? 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 Okay. So the solution is a number that when uh, substituted It's called the variable. The statement is true. <laughs> the statement be in the equation, or it might be an inequality, or it might be something else. Okay, but in this case, it'll be an equation. So when we find that number three, we know it's the solution. We plug it in. <coughs> Excuse me. When you plug it in for x, it makes the equation true. That's what a solution. Is. All right, so now that we've redefined that for the uh, the but not the last time, we'll bring that up again in the future. Is this going to be on the test? <laughs> uh, it might be. Oh, oh, no. <laughs>
Alright, All right, so let's start with this equation. Uh, 25 <laughs> equals x squared. Okay. Find a solution to this equation. Five. Yeah, five. Any other solution? No. Negative. Negative. Uh, uh, two, like, two, three, two, three. X could be five. <laughs> X could be negative five. Another way to say that is X could be positive or negative five. Alright. But X squared plus five X equals zero. X is zero as a solution. Any other solution? Some some other things. <laughs> no, not negative zero. <laughs> <laughs> zero is zero. It's not positive or it's not negative. It's right in between positives and negatives. So what today is about is making these solutions easier to find. Okay. The, the key to it is, the biggest key to it is that it's equal to zero. Equal to zero. That's key. It's got to be equal to zero. If it's not equal to zero, do not proceed. It's got to be equal to zero. Solving quadratics is a lot about it being equal to zero. Okay. Here's why. Uh, if we set it equal to zero, and then we do this, I'm just going to rewrite this as x times x plus 5. First of all, is this the same as that? And how do you know? Because you do distributive. Do distributive, that's what you get, x plus 5x. Now, it's equal to 0, and we're multiplying two things together. Right? We talked about this in the quiz question. It makes it pretty easy to find the values of x that are the solution, because if this is zero, this thing that you're multiplying by is zero, well, you multiply by zero, so it's zero. So what if this is zero? You multiply by zero and you should get zero. Right? So by writing it as a product and making that product equal to zero, it's really a clever idea. Like the first guy who thought of this was probably pretty happy that he, that was, that he came up with this really clever idea. To write it as something times something equals zero means that if either one of those things that you're multiplying is zero, you got the solution. If this is zero, or if this is zero, then what you're doing is multiplying by zero. Something times zero is zero. So x is zero, or x is equal to negative five. I gave you negative five, you were able to verify that it was a solution. But to find a solution, it's a really good idea to write it as something times something, to what's called factor. It's called factory because why is three a factor of 15? Because three times something is 15, right? We've talked about this a few times. Something being a factor, something else means you write it as this times that. These are factors of this. X is a factor of x squared plus 5x because if you multiply by x plus 5, you get that, and likewise x plus 5 is a factor. So we factored it just like we would factor 15 or factor 75 or whatever. Okay? Well, let's try our hand at factoring something a little bit trickier. same as this by just distributing, by multiplying it together. Mm -hmm. So it must be that whatever these two parentheses are, we should be able to multiply the two parentheses together and get that. Okay. Well, here's, here's something really that is 
probably the most clear, most obvious thing. How am I going to get an x squared by multiplying? X times x. x, times x. So that's got to be a part of it. But then we have this, this uh, 6x plus 5. That can't be all it is. Okay. Well, we're going to multiply together. We're going to multiply these two functions together. We're going to distribute everything in here to everything in here. Right? Uh, so we know x times x is the only way to get x squared. Well, how are you going to get just a number by itself? How, what are you going to multiply together to get just a number? I'm not, not, not five. I'm just saying just a number. How do you multiply? What two things would you multiply together to get a number? Regular numbers. Regular numbers. Like not numbers with variables attached to them, right? OK. So we must multiply two numbers together to get five. What can we multiply to get five? Those are my only options, right? Five times one is five. Great. Does that guarantee that we're right? No, we got to distribute it all completely and see if it works out. Well, x times x is x squared. One times five is five. We, that's how we found these numbers, right? The only other things that didn't get distributed yet are x to five and one to x. x times five is five x. One times x is. So it turns out, like this is going to get. This is a coefficient. And this is going to be the coefficient of this x. So these numbers are just going to be the coefficients of x. And now we're going to have two x terms that are like terms. And we're going to add them together. Do they add together to make 6? Yes. Right? 6x? Yes. That's exactly what they do. So by, by distributing, multiplying these two things together, we verify that we're right. Right? right. Um, give you one and I'll give you about like 30 seconds to, to get started on it. Let's try um, <coughs> that was number three by the way. Number five is a squared minus 13a plus Well, we got to get an a squared. We know that's going to be a times a. When we distribute the a to the a, we're going to get a squared. Okay? We know the constant has to come from a constant times a constant. This constant times this constant. 11 and 2. That's really the only way we can get 22, right? Or 22 times 1. So let's try 11 and uh, 2. Okay. Well, when we multiply them together, we want to get a positive 22. What are the two ways you can get a positive? Two positives, two positives or two negatives. Positives or two negatives. Okay. Now, before we decide which is what, which one it is, positives or negatives, let's think. What do we want to add to get? A negative. Right. So the only way to multiply to get a positive with negatives is negative times negative, and the only way to add to get negatives is well, if you give the choice, only two negatives is going to work. Right. And negative eleven a minus two a is negative 13a, so we did it. Oh, I got one more. <laughs> All right, so here's why we're doing it. We're not doing this for nothing. We're not just factoring for the fun of it, although it is a lot of fun. The reason why we're doing it is because we're being very clever. First step. Are we basically doing what we're doing for now? Essentially, here's the, the last piece. Here is the important part. We make sure that first it's equal to zero, because then this would be equal to zero. And the very important part about it being equal to zero is <coughs> if this is zero, <coughs> which means a is 11, then you're multiplying by zero. So the answer must be zero. You must have found the solution. Or if this is zero, which means a is 2, well, if this is zero, you're, again, you're multiplying by zero, which means you must get the answer zero. You must have found the solution. Right? So what we did is very clever. That we set it equal to zero, we turn it into factors, into a product, and use the zero product. Product. Okay. Goodbye. Have a good day.